ONTAP has a lot of different data protection technologies available. In this lecture, I'll give you an overview of all of them and how they all fit together. Data protection ensures that your data remains available in the case of failure of part or all of the storage system hardware or software. So part would be, for example, one controller in the cluster failing. All of the system failing would obviously be the entire cluster failing. Other things that can happen would be failure of the entire physical site. So you could have a failure of a single hardware component in the cluster, or perhaps the ONTAP operating system failed somehow, or even the entire site went down because of a flood or a fire or a complete power outage, something like that. ONTAP does have data protection solutions for all of those incidents occurring. Other things that could happen are data corruption, or accidental deletion. If either one of those things happen, you want to be able to get the data back in the good state it was in before that happened. So starting off with hardware redundancy. An ONTAP storage system can, and usually is, implemented with no hardware single points of failure. Redundant components are used to ensure that the system can withstand a failure of any single instance of a hardware component type. So it's a, it protects against a single point of failure. So for example, if a single disk or a single disk shelf or a single controller failed, then the cluster can carry on operating. Now, if you have a failure of two components of the same type, then it's not guaranteed to protect against that. And sometimes students bring this up with me and see that as being a problem. But the thing is, you could design the system to have no dual points of failure. But then I could say, well, what if two things fail? Oh, we'll need three. Oh, well, what if three things fail? We'll need four. So you could go on and on. And obviously the chance of two hardware components of the same type coincidentally failing at the same time is very unlikely. It's very rare for any hardware component to fail. So for two of them to fail at the same time is highly unlikely. And if that highly unlikely event did somehow occur, there are still other features that can be used such as Metro Cluster and StatMitter in conjunction with the hardware redundancy that do protect against that. Okay, so let's look at the redundant hardware components. We've got the controllers, the disk shelves, the disk shelf cables and the disks. So the two main components in the cluster are the controllers and the disk shelves and also the connections between them and the disks in the shelves. We have got redundant hardware for all of those different components. I'll start off at the bottom level with the disks and the way that redundancy is provided for disks failing is with RAID. RAID 4 protects against failure of a single disk in a RAID group. RAID DP for your dual protection protects against failure of two disks in a RAID group. And RAID Tech, which is a triple erasure coding, protects against failure of three disks in a RAID group. We already covered this in detail in the physical resources section, so I don't need to cover it again in this section. Okay, next thing that we have got is disk shelf redundancy. So you see there that with RAID, it will protect for up to three disk failures in a single RAID group, but obviously our disk shelves have got more than three disks in them. So what if the entire shelf fails? Well, that is where sync mirror comes in. Sync mirror protects against failure of a disk shelf by mirroring data across two separate shelves. So you see here in our example, we've got disk shelf one, which has got aggregate one in it, made up of a couple of different RAID groups in our example. If that disk shelf fails to protect against the failure, what we do is we mirror the same data across two different shelves. So you can see aggregate one, RAID group one, zero, RAID group one, and again, RAID group zero, RAID group one with the same data on the different disk shelf. In the example here, I'm only using five disks in a RAID group. Obviously, in real world, you'd have more than five disks in your RAID group, but I'm only using five here because I don't want to take up the entire room on my slide. 
Okay, so with Sync Mirror, if one of the disk shelf fails and the data is still on the other disk shelf, we've got the other copy of it, so the data is still accessible. Because the data is stored in two sets of disks, twice as many disks are required with Sync Mirror though, so because of this, Sync Mirror is optional. RAID is not optional. Whenever you configure your aggregates, you have to use either RAID 4, RAID DP, or RAID Tech. But for Sync Mirror, because it does use double the amount of disks, which is going to add to the cost of the system, because of that, Sync Mirror is optional if you want to have that configured or not. Next thing that we have is redundancy for our disk shelf cables, and that comes from MPHA, which is multipath high availability. MPHA uses redundant cable paths to each stack of disk shelves. So you can see in our example here, we've got the controller at the top and we've got a stack of disk shelves under there. Now we don't have a separate cable going to each one of the disk shelves because you can have up to 10 disk shelves in a stack and we don't want to have to use 10 different ports on the back of our controller and have 10 different cables going to the disk shelves. Obviously that wouldn't be manageable. So what we do is from the controller, we have a single cable that goes to the top shelf in the stack and then we're daisy chained down from there. But as you can see, that gives us a problem in that if any one of those cables fails, then we're going to lose connectivity to disk shelves. So to stop losing connectivity, what we do is we have multipath HA, where from a second port on the controller, we connect that to the bottom shelf in the stack. And now if any one cable goes down, we've still got co connectivity to all of the different disk shelves. MPHA, just like RAID, should also always be used. Okay, next one we have redundancy for is our controllers. And our ONTAP controllers are arranged in HA high availability pairs. The controllers in an HA pair are connected to each other's disk shelves so that in case one of the controllers goes down, the other one can still serve its data. If a controller fails, the other controller in that HA pair will take ownership of the failed controller's aggregates. If both controllers in an HA pair fail, the aggregates owned by those controllers will not be available. Again, as I was saying earlier, with the hardware redundancy, it protects against a single point of failure. If two controllers in an HA pair fail, that's not a single failure, that is two different failures. Again, super highly unlikely that that would ever happen. So say you've got a four node cluster and you've got controllers one and two are in an HA pair and controllers three and four are in another HA pair. Well, if controller one and controller three go down, the other HA partner is still up, so you'll still have access to all of the data. But if controller one and controller two go down, then you will lose access to the data that was hosted on controllers one or two. You would still have access to the data that was hosted on controllers three and four. So looking at how HA works, you can see here that we have got a controller it's connected to the client network and it's connected to its disk shelves. Now it is possible that you can have a single controller configuration if you want, but that is not commonly used because it does have a single point of failure. So to make sure that that controller is not a single point of failure, we put a second controller in and then that controller two is connected to controller one's disk shelves. We also have a high availability connection between the two controllers that's used for the NVA RAM mirroring and also keep alives between the controllers so they can connect, they can detect if the other controller goes down. So if controller one does go down because controller two is connected to its disk shelves, controller two will take ownership of those disks and it's still able to serve the data. Now in the diagram here, this would be an active standby configuration because controller one is normally active and in that case controller two is just as a standby. We don't want that to be the case. We want to make maximum use of our resources. So because of that, we're going to have active active. Controller two is also going to own its aggregates as well. And for redundancy for controller two's aggregates, controller one will be connected to controller two's disk shelves. Okay, moving on. So those were our hardware redundancies that protect against a single point of failure. So hardware component redundancy does ensure that an on-tap system remains available should any single instance of a hardware component type fail. But 
what if multiple instances of a hardware component type fail, highly unlikely, or a bit more likely the entire physical site goes offline because you have a flood or a fire or a complete electrical failure, something like that. Well, we've got solutions to help with that too. Disaster recovery, DR options, replicate data between two physical sites. So if one site goes down, you've still got the data in another site and you can access it in that other site as well. Our options for this are Metro Cluster and Snap Mirror. So let's look at the problem with high availability if the entire site goes down. And you can see here, we've got our two controllers in an HA pair. And here, if controller one goes down because controller two is connected to its dish shelves, it can serve the data in aggregate one. But what if controller one and controller two were in two different buildings and building one goes down. So the entire building has gone down. In that case, we've not we've lost not just the controller, but the disk shelves as well. And it doesn't help that controller two is connected to controller one's disk shelves because the disk shelves are down. We've lost access to aggregate one. So because this situation can happen, this is where Metro Cluster comes in. Metro Cluster is a single system that combines HA and Sync Mirror as well. So it combines the HA for the controller redundancy with Sync Mirror for the disk shelf redundancy. So as you can see here now, we have got our controllers in two separate buildings and aggregate one, the data is located in building one and in building two as well. So we use Sync Mirror to have it duplicated across the two different dish shelves and we do that for aggregate two as well so now if we do have that complete building failure again building one goes down building two still has access to both aggregate one and aggregate two we've still got access to all of the data so that was metro cluster next one we've got is snap mirror snap mirror replicates volumes from one net app system to another so just like with Metro Cluster, where it has your data in the two different sites and we keep them in sync with each other, Snap Mirror does a very similar thing. It can also replicate volumes within the same cluster, but by far the most common use case is going to be between different clusters. So as you can see in the diagram here, we've got a source cluster here and we're replicating its data to another physical site. And we can actually replicate it to more than one physical site if we wanted to, like you see here, it's going to three different physical sites. So now you're maybe wondering, okay, well, that sounds like Metro Cluster and Snap Mirror do a very similar thing. Why have we got the two different technologies? So let's explain that next. First off, I need to give you some terminology, which is RPO and RTO. Recovery point objective, the RPO, is how much data can be lost following failover to the DR site in the worst case scenario. And this is directly related to how often you are replicating. So for example, let's say we've got our main site and our disaster recovery site, and we replicate the data once every 10 minutes. Well, if we had done the last replication 10 minutes ago, and then nine minutes and 59 seconds later, so just before we were about to do the next replication, we lose the main site. Well, in that case, we've lost nine minutes and 59 seconds of data. The last 10 minutes it was written has not been replicated to the DR site. And if the main site is gone forever, when we've lost that 10 minutes worth of data. So the RPO is worst case scenario, how much data could be lost if you have to fail over to the DR site, and it basically equals how often you are replicating the data. The other important piece of terminology as far as DR is concerned is the RTO, which is recovery time objective. That is how long it takes to fail over to the DR site. And it's not as easy to calculate this one by just looking at a metric, like how often you're replicating. The RTO, it really depends on your company's processes of what they do in the case of having to fail over to the DR site. So the way that you find out what your RTO is, is by testing. Do a test failover and see how long it takes you to get up and running and everybody able to access the data in the DR site. Obviously you want to get this as low as possible. 
So now you know about terminology, let's look at some of the differences between Metro Cluster and Snap Mirror. Metro Cluster is capable of zero RPO. Metro Cluster uses synchronous replication, so there's no gap at all between the data being written to the two sites. And it has an RTO, a recovery time objective, of 120 seconds or less. Because with Metro Cluster, the failover can be automated. So it gives you a very, very quick failover. You can either automate it or to actually do it yourself manually. It's basically just a single command to do that. So zero RPO and very, very fast RTO with Metro Cluster. With SnapMirror, you can either do it synchronous or asynchronous. So you can have the two sites where they're constantly synchronized with each other. There's no delay there. Or you can do it asynchronous where you're going to replicate based on a schedule. So with SnapMirror synchronous, obviously the RPO is going to be zero because they're kept completely in sync all the time. With SnapMirror synchronous, the RTO can be low, but failover does require manual intervention, unlike with Metro Cluster. And the last one we've got is SnapMirror asynchronous. The most frequently that you can replicate with SnapMirror asynchronous is once every minute. Typically, you'll be doing it less frequently than that. And the failover requires manual intervention because it's using the same SnapMirror engine as SnapMirror Synchronous. So looking at that, you're maybe thinking, well, I'm not going to use SnapMirror then, I'm always going to use MetroCluster. But there is a but. So MetroCluster has some limitations on the supported hardware and software configuration. And in your environment, it might just not be doable to use Metro Cluster. There's also a limit on the physical distance between sites as well. Because it is using synchronous replication, if it takes too long to get the data from one site to the other and back again and then back to the clients, then the client applications can time out and that's gonna break those client applications. So if you're using synchronous replication, which Metro Cluster does, then you need to have the sites close together in the same metro area. That's why it's called Metro Cluster. And we're all, there are also those limitations on the supported hardware and software configuration as well. So it's not always possible to use Metro Cluster. Next one we had was Snap Mirror Synchronous. That does have a distance limitation as well, again, because it's using synchronous replication, but it has less configuration limitations than Metro Cluster does. It does require manual failover. And SnapMirror asynchronous has no distance limitation and it supports many configurations. So with SnapMirror asynchronous, your two sites can be on the other side of the world from each other. You would just to have a need to have a reasonable delay between the synchronizations for that to be working okay. Also with SnapMirror asynchronous, there's very, very few limitations on the supported configurations. You can actually use that with other NetApp systems other than ONTAP. SnapMirror also has use cases other than DR, such as migrating data between two different sites. So Metro Cluster, it's always used as a high availability solution. With SnapMirror, it's most commonly used as a disaster recovery solution, but you can use it for some other use cases as well. Now, the two features there, Metro Cluster and SnapMirror, they're not mutually exclusive. So you could use just Metro Cluster, or you could use just SnapMirror, or you could use both features at the same time. And again, as we go through the course, I'll be covering SnapMirror and Metro Cluster in more detail. Okay, so that was our disaster recovery options. And DR options keep data in sync across multiple physical sites. And because of this, if data becomes corrupted in your main site, well, that corruption is gonna be replicated to the backup site as well. So DR is not like a one-stop solution. It provides your disaster recovery and backup and all the data protection you need because your data could be corrupted and that's gonna be replicated to all the different sites. You need to have backup as well. So backup is also required to enable recovery of corrupted or accidentally deleted data. The options for backup are snapshots, which we covered earlier in the course, Snap Vault, and there's also third-party solutions available. SnapMirror and Snap Vault 
both use the Snap Mirror engine to replicate data between NetApp storage systems. So the, the way that they work is very, very similar. The configuration is very, very similar as well. Snap Mirror is primarily a disaster recovery solution, which syncs data to a secondary DR site. The secondary site can be made live, meaning read write, if the primary system becomes unavailable. Typically, when you've got your DR site, well, actually always, the primary site is going to be a read write copy and the DR site will be a read only copy. You can't have two different sites both being writable because if that was the case, if users were able to write to the same volumes in two different sites, then it would not be possible to keep the volumes consistent. So one side, your main site is always the writable copy. The DR site is read only. But with the DR solution, if the main site becomes available, becomes unavailable, then you can fail over to the DR site and it becomes the read write copy at that point. So Snap Mirror primarily used as a DR solution. Snap Vault is a backup solution. It maintains multiple copies of the data going back over time on the secondary site, which can be restored in the case of data corruption or accidental deletion. So Snap Mirror just keeps basically one copy of the data in both sites and keeps them in sync with each other depending on your replication schedule. Snap Vault has more than one copy in, in the secondary site, it's going to have multiple copies going back over time, which can be used as a backup. And we also have unified replication available as well, which combines Snap Mirror and Snap Vault functionality. This means that if, say if you had a volume and you wanted to have DR for that volume and also backup for that volume as well, well, if we didn't have unified replication, then you could replicate it to one volume in the secondary site for DR and replicate it to another separate volume for backup. Obviously, that would not be very efficient because it would take up twice the amount of space and it would also take up more network bandwidth as well. So with unified replication, you just have the one destination volume, which serves as both the DR and as the backup as well. So let's talk about some implications here with our disaster recovery and backup. Storage systems should always be backed up. In the real world, users always lose, accidentally delete data. Happens all the time. So you need to have backup so you can get it back again. Also, data can be corrupted as well. So if you've got a NetApp system, enterprise level storage, absolutely for sure, you are going to have a backup solution there. Disaster recovery is optional. And way back in the day, it used to be expensive to implement a disaster recovery solution because if you were the enterprise, you needed to have a disaster recovery building that you would be able to fail over to. So having that building was an expensive proposition. But the cost and the ease of implementing disaster recovery has come way down since the prevalence of cloud. So with ONTAP, ONTAP can run in hardware solutions in your data center. There's also cloud solutions there as well. Also with NetApp, with their data fabric, you can replicate between different operating systems. So because of this, with the data fabric, it makes the disaster recovery much more viable, much more cost effective. So it's much more likely that your organization is going to be having a disaster recovery solution in the present climate. Okay, last thing to tell you about here is Snap Center, which is a, another software solution from NetApp. It provides central management of your disaster recovery, backup, restore, and clone operations. So if you've got 10 different on tap clusters, rather than having to manage them individually with Snap Map Center, you can manage them all from the single pane of glass. ONTAP can also integrate with third-party software such as Commvault, Veeam, Cleondris, and Catalogic. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with NetApp Storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also, check out my NetApp Storage Complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.